Welcome again to Engaging Multilingual Newcomers. Today's focus is on instruction in the classroom. And again, this series has been based on WIDA's e-workshop um, named Classroom Teachers Engaging Multilingual Newcomers. And if you haven't um, signed up for that course, I would encourage you to do it. It's a two hour course has lots of great information um, and some wonderful videos, which I will share a few of them today if we have time, but I think that it would be definitely worth your time to um, investigate these ideas in that way as well. Just revisiting some of our terminology that we've talked about. Um, I'm not going to go into them, but just as a refresher, We've talked about multilingual learner, multilingual newcomers, acculturation, family, trauma, and students who have been identified as SLIFE or students with limited or interrupted formal education. Those are some of our areas of focus during this PLC. Today, my objective um, for this presentation is that we will develop a deeper understanding of key instructional practices in the areas of teacher actions, student actions, leveraging primary or home languages in the classroom, and supporting meaningful language use. I also hope that we'll be able to describe effective actions for surfacing student assets for greater engagement in instruction and assessment. So the pieces that we're going to put together today when we're talking about instruction for engagement of newcomers include gathering information, surfacing student assets, using language as meaning making, addressing all language domains within instruction, providing opportunities for language practice and creating and maintaining high expectations. We're going to start by looking at the WIDA language domains. For most of you who have been in this field, you will remember that WIDA language domains were based on listening and speaking, reading and writing. With the new 2020 um, standards framework, that has been changed and evolved just a bit. WIDA now talks about interpretive modes and expressive modes. So interpretive modes include listening, reading, and viewing has been added. Expressive modes include speaking, writing, and representing. And representing includes using facial expressions, gestures, and also artwork, painting, drawing, um, role-playing, any of those would be ways to express information. Both of these modes are representative of how communication takes place, especially during language acquisition. Here's another way that WIDA represents these language domains. We have the listening and reading together under the interpretive domain with viewing included. And then we have writing and speaking under the expressive domain with representing included. So really we're maintaining the interpretive and expressive, but adding those larger pieces of viewing and representing so that students who perhaps aren't using words in English yet, can still have an active role in the classroom. Moving on to the idea of gathering information to surface student assets. To best serve our students and engage them, we want to know about their experiences their social and emotional learning, their cultural experiences and knowledge, and their linguistic experiences and knowledge. When you have these pieces of information about your students, you can then access the students' contributions and potential for the classroom. So 
So what are some great ways to surface student assets? Well, we have something from the very beginning. When we do registration or intake, we can create intake questionnaires. Um, there is an example intake questionnaire on the DOE Multilingual Learner website. That is one example of what could be used. And I also just want to take a moment to, to just mention that some of the questions that are on that example might be quite sensitive for some families. So whenever you're doing a, um, an interview or a questionnaire with a student or family, of course, you know, be sensitive, pay attention to body language. You may just not want to ask some things that you had hoped or planned to ask based on the family's reaction or um, comfort level. There's also um, asking students to write, tell, or draw their story. Parent interviews, you know, you may be doing parent-teacher conferences, but for your parents of newcomers, you may want to use that opportunity for also learning about parents, learning um, what their views are about their students learning, um, anything that they could offer to help you plan instruction for that, for that student. Um, going to community events, both within the school and the student's community making home visits, creating student profiles or student portraits, as we've talked about in, in past sessions, and then making time in your class for icebreakers and get to know you activities and games. Sometimes it feels like we don't have time for that, but even if you did it you know, once a week in, a, in some kind of short way, you would have a chance to get to know your students in a new way. So at this point, we're going to do a short turn and talk. And I'm going to use breakout rooms. It's just going to be from a couple of minutes. And I'm going to put you in groups of two or three. I'm going to ask you to respond to the following sentence frames. So uh, there are three prompts here. Our school community does blank well to promote collaboration. And that's referencing our last PLC session around collaboration. Changes I would like to see are blank with a goal of increased collaboration. The next slide is about surfacing student assets. The activities that are already in my educator toolbox are I gather what kind of information with these activities. The activities I would like to cultivate for my classroom are in order to, well, what's your goal? In order to get to know your students' personalities about their home life, um, their interests, their, their goals, their aspirations. And then the following one, teacher actions that are currently strengths for me. So what do you do well? And, and do frequently? And then what's the one idea that you would like to add to your frequently used teacher actions? I am going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. And I, just thinking about the best way to do this. So what I'll do is I will set up the breakout rooms and then I will share that screen again so that you can um, jot down those, those prompts. And they, you don't have to have the prompt exactly. Um, an estimation would be great. So I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms. It looks like there are um, seven of you. So we'll just do, there we 
we go. We, I'm going to create these and then I'm going to repost those prompts. And if you guys get talking beyond the prompts, that's great. I'm going to give you um, four minutes in the breakout rooms. And I'll see you when you're back. Recording again, and I'll share that screen. Again, thank you for sharing your thoughts about what, what's working well. Um, here we go. So I'm going to return to talking about students who have been identified as life. Um, we have talked a lot about this um, off and on throughout this PLC. I'm just going to touch on some of the main points again. Um, a key approach for instruction for students who have been identified as life is to create a curriculum that revolves around students' experiences. And these are four really great resources regarding working with SLIFE students. And I also wanted to just highlight again that the main DOE is partnering with Support Ed and Support Ed is offering um, four two hour sessions regarding different aspects of working with students who've been identified as SLIFE. And they are listed on our professional learning page. And the next one is coming up quite soon. One has already happened. One is coming up quite soon. And um, all you need to do is register for them and, and show up. And they're very interesting, very engaging. So I would encourage if you can find the time to do that. If, if you can't do it at the moment that it's on, I believe they're being recorded and posted to our website as well. So one of the key elements is using language as meaning making and giving students language practice time. So structured ways to practice using language throughout the lesson. The elements of language as meaning making means that students need daily practice for interpreting sources of meaning, expressing meaning, co-constructing meaning with peers and teachers, and adapting the expression of meaning for the audience. And then what are practices that help educators maintain high expectations as students are building language proficiency? So these are some instructional strategies. We're gonna talk about all four of these as we go forward. Teacher actions that help to support high expectations in student engagement, leveraging primary or whole languages, supporting meaningful language use and student actions for the classroom. We'll start with teacher actions. Teachers design the lesson to have students engage in meaning-making language practices. The four language practices are interpreting disciplinary meaning, expressing disciplinary meaning, co-constructing disciplinary meaning, and adapting the expression. And um, that is probably a whole <laughs> a whole uh, presentation in itself, but I have included here um, a WIDA focus bulletin, which addresses a lot of that <clears throat> for the classroom. And I, I would encourage you to check out that WIDA focus bulletin. It's the February, 2021. It will go into that a lot deeper, more than I have time to do today. So when either creating um, a lesson plan or unit yourself, or if you're coaching another um, colleague through the steps for engaging students through your instructional planning, 
the one of the first steps is reviewing students' learning portraits or the student portraits that um, you may have created. And we've talked about how to do this. Um, we've talked about you know finding out about what students like, what they have experienced, what their background is, what their strengths are, what their passions are, what their challenges are, and creating uh, one sheet of paper that houses that information about that student so you can return to that and remember what assets you can draw on as you're planning for that student to be engaged in the classroom. And then providing embedded language supports like word walls, sentence stems, and discourse moves or talk moves, um, language frames or sentence frames throughout your lesson, throughout the classroom. It's always key to provide adequate, adequate wait time or even provide students with um, the information about what question or what activity you're going to ask them to do ahead of time so that they have a little extra time for preparing. And then really key is grouping um, pair work, such as turn and talk or partners or small group activities, because we know that engaging with other students having a chance to work out meaning and work out communication is really key in order to develop language proficiency. Other teacher actions that are essential for multilingual learners, especially those at level one and level two proficiency, modeling, um, offering opportunities for short structured conversations throughout the lesson rather than waiting until the end of the lesson, display or post the steps for the activity and use those steps to guide the students through the lesson. Activities that invite students to express verbally and non-verbally so that each level of student has a way to join in and contribute. And then crafted questions, which are meant to engage the student at their level. So for a level one student, you might craft questions that really are yes or no, or um, WH questions, questions that could be answered non-verbally. That's one way of, of preparing for the, those students. Further teacher actions. And I, th I keep coming back to this over and over again, as I do site visits and observations, the things, the items on the last slide and, and this slide really keep coming up. So creating consistent routines and expectations. The more students know what's going to happen and the routine of the classroom, the routine of the lessons, it allows students to take risks and join in, even if they're not quite sure how to do the activity, if they know the steps and they know what it looks like, and it's similar day after day, they will be ready to join in. Give immediate feedback with an opportunity for students to self-revise. Um, providing descriptive and actionable feedback is important. It helps build awareness, it helps the students to make decisions for their learning. And overall, it's a goal of more complex language use. Sometimes when we think about feedback with um, a multilingual learner or any language learner, we think of it as a corrective action. And I wanna just be clear that I'm not promoting that as a corrective action, but more of like a chance for students to increase the complexity or the amount of language that they're using. We're not looking for perfection or even complete accuracy. We're looking for more language and more complex language as the goal. Okay, coming up, we're going to do another think, pair, share in breakout rooms. And there's two questions. And if you wanna jot these down, um, as I'm just introducing them, these will be what I ask you to share in your groups. 
which teacher actions are currently strengths for you? And which teacher actions would you like to focus on strengthening this year? And I will share those again once you're in your breakout rooms. Okay, I'm gonna pause the recording while I get these set up. Okay, thank you for doing those breakout rooms and sharing some of your reflections. Oops, too many. So we're gonna move on to the idea of leveraging primary languages. And I think the shift right now in thinking in the ESOL world is just recognizing how valuable a student's primary language is. It's instrumental in acquiring another language. Using a primary language allows children to communicate their feelings and ideas with their families, build trusting relationships, engage with the structure and purpose of language, and continue to develop their identity. So we're, we're looking at primary languages as a bridges for students rather than barriers, which I think is a shift in thinking from when I started working in ESOL 20 years ago, especially um, in areas where I've been working where there aren't large communities of same language speakers. Um, oftentimes the only time a student would use their primary language is in the home. And when they came to school, it was there was no place for it. And I'm really happy to see that shift. I think it's, I think it's gonna be a great shift. So we can just keep in mind that primary language is an integral part of the student's identity and we wanna support that. And when we can do things to, to represent primary languages in schools and in the school community, students are empowered as contributing members. Um, if, when you have the opportunity to talk to parents at conferences or LAC meetings, you can ask them about their child's primary language or languages proficiency levels in all four do domains. Ask how their child uses language at home. What are their strengths and what are the areas that parents might be concerned about with language use? Um, that might help you understand more about the child's learning style as they are developing their English proficiency. Again, we can build primary language into the morning routines, into opening and closing activities for the day or the lesson. We can ask students to read or write in their primary language first and then in English. We can ask students to use their primary language in groups or pair activities. And we can use cognates to support vocabulary development and provide students with the tools and the time to locate and connect with those cognates. For example, you could do a word wall with cognates on it, the English word and the um, primary language cognate. And that leads us to this idea of translanguaging. And this is sort of the outcome of promoting primary language development and use in the classroom. Translanguaging is the act performed by bilinguals of accessing different linguistic features or various modes of what are described as autonomous languages in order to maximize communicative potential. So for example, you have two languages and the students are bringing together the skills that they have in each language in order to maximize their ability to communicate. And that's also maximizing their ability to take in and grapple with content material. When we're supporting students in translanguaging and developing their skills for translanguaging, we wanna have a focus on communication, continuing to support the student's identity by involving their primary language in their learning. And 
overall maximizing language capacity. When we invite students to use their primary languages, we are creating a much larger expansive picture of what they can do. Moving on to supporting meaningful language use. We know that sensory, graphic, and interactive supports provide multilingual learners with pathways to construct meaning. We can embed graphic organizers and visual supports into our content area instruction. Clearly post tasks and directions, model the process and expectations, provide a finished example, and provide sentence frames. These all give ways students, students ways to attach what they know to the unit or the lesson or the task at hand. Students need frequent and extended classroom interaction, both structured and open-ended, using both home or primary languages and English. And that's where we come back again to those student groupings, using pairs and small group work um, frequently throughout the lessons so the students have a way to engage with each other. So now for student actions, students can learn to use tools such as anchor charts, journals, word banks, language or, or sentence frames, photos, videos, physical objects, technology, picture books, vocabulary notebooks. These are all skills that students can develop to be active in the classroom. Students can engage with technology, um, student mentors, visuals with chunks of language and mentor texts. Again, I think I've said this maybe five times already today, but working with and presenting with peers or groups is a wonderful way for students to engage with English and engage with content. And then again, guided opportunities to self-correct. And that is itself a skill to learn how to self-correct. So that's an action that students can take. We have already addressed this question, but I'm bringing it back again. We're not going to do breakout rooms at this point, but I just want to give you another opportunity to think through, jot down an idea or two of what actions do you want to take? It might just be one simple activity that you want to try, or it might be an overarching theme that you want to engage with. And then what supports do you need? Last time we talked a lot about what do we need for engaging with collaboration with our, with our colleagues and time was the thing that we needed. Um, what teacher actions or student actions would you like to support and what would you need in order to do that? That's just for self-reflection. Um, we're at the question stage. I'm going to stop sharing. We have eight minutes. Um, and I would like to be able to show you one of the videos from the WIDA session if, if everyone's up for that. It's between two and three minutes. Okay, I got a thumbs up on that. So we'll, we'll give it a try. Um, if you bear with me. I have several of them pulled up here. Hmm, that's not it. This is, I'm gonna, I'll, I will share this one. I'm not getting it right. I apologize. It's trying to share two things at once, not working for me. Okay. Um, here we go. Um, if this video is not playing nicely for you, if you would just unmute and let me know and I'll go back and share it in a different way.
I don't hear anything. Okay. Thank you. My number one job, I think, is to learn who my students are. I do that in a couple different ways, one of which is um, home visits. I think that's really important to get um, to know my students and their families and what funds of knowledge they can bring to the classroom, particularly with my newcomers. Uh, some, some people say, can you tell me how can you speak English? I say, I'm coming. And, here, and my dad said, we are going to America and we are coming here. It was really important that I get into their homes quickly in the year um, to find out more about their story, how they got here to America, um, why they're here, um, what they like to do, um, all the background that I could bring into the classroom. Um, on top of that, then, I try to get involved in the community as much as I can. Um, for example, those same newcomers are really active in Millennium Soccer on Saturday mornings. Saturday, and we are going to play soccer with the racket team. I'm very, very, very good in that team soccer. That way I can't get them. So I make sure that I go to those practices often so I can just connect with their families and talk to um, the parents and the sidelines. And it's a great way to connect with the kids, too. Um, I do. Just me. I'm uh, running faster. Nobody can get me. I have four. I go. And I, I'm not going because I still go and I, was, I do that. We were studying um, orangutans in Borneo and rainforest, and, and that came because a couple of our students are really passionate about rainforests and learning about deforestation and things like that. So um, finding out what they care about kind of leads to the lesson planning. Can we figure out how many orangutans will Armani see? Mm -hmm. All right. We count out 18 orangutans. Huh? Ahmed, would you like to draw or build? I'm going to draw it. You want to draw? Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna draw it. Okay. That's just a short and a uh, video, and there are several of those in that um, course. I'm not going to play anymore because we're out of time. But I, um, there's there are some longer ones which I think are really inspirational and really show a lot of great different strategy use. And again, if you if you go through the course, you'll see them. We are just about out of time. Does anybody have anything they want me to address before we go? Everyone's happy. Okay. <laughs> um, just gonna check the chat to see if there's anything. No, no pressing. Can you explain questions. how to access those videos? Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, you will need a WIDA login for like the WIDA.Wisconsin. Um, if you don't have one, you can um, email them directly or call them. And then you go to the Grow tab. And go to the e-learning options. And for Maine, there are, I believe, 10 courses that are free on that and you you um, can it, you would want to choose this one which is classroom teachers engaging multilingual newcomers that's the title and it, and it goes over the same things we've gone over in this course is, course which is so, social and emotional learning the um, importance of collaboration and then instructional strategies and it's two hours yeah awesome okay. thank you you're welcome. Um, shoot me an email if I can be of any support or help. And thank you so much for participating in this. And um, if you have something that you'd like us to investigate doing for another PLC, let me know. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.